Hi, this is Austin Wagner, and I'm a student for Professor Diobro's oral history course here at Monmouth University. And today I'm conducting an interview for the Monmouth County 9-11 and its aftermath project. And I'm interviewing John Acapinti, a retired Lieutenant Colonel for the US Army. And he also served as a DOD civilian and as a site manager for the former Fort Monmouth Army base, as well as other leading roles. And just to get started off, uh, could you just explain where and when you were born and maybe tell me a little bit about your childhood? Yes, as uh, first of all, hello, Austin, it's good to be here. As you mentioned, I'm John Edward Acapinti, Lieutenant Colonel, Army retired. Uh, I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, about an hour north of where we are right now. Um, Catholic school upbringing, Catholic high school, uh, William Patterson College, uh, played a little football there. Not too great, overachieved <laughs> to be average. Uh, played some baseball in high school, worked. I've been working since I was 14. Wow. Uh, great parents, brother and sister, good family. Um, and then in 1981, I decided at that uh, point to join the Army, which I actually did, which was 10 days after I married my lovely bride, Fran. Oh, wow. So, so that takes me from little baby up until the time I started my military career. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and you kind of got into it, but uh, my second question was going to be, what inspired you to join the U.S. military, and did you also grow up in a military family? A second question first. I, my father served, my uncle served, a couple, actually all my uncles, but it was, we don't consider it a military family because I'm the first that made a career. Dad was in during Korea, uh, state, stateside. Uncle Sam was quite the war hero in World War II. Uh, served in Patton's army, was involved in liberating one of the uh, concentration camps. Oh, wow. um, and the reason, Austin, that I decided to join is actually a pretty good, uh, pretty good story, I believe. In the late 70s, there was a thing called the um, Iran hostage crisis. I don't know how much you know of that. I know a little bit. Not too much. We were held hostage, a bunch of our folks, maybe 40 or 50, for like four, over 400 days. And I was working in my dad's delivery service, getting my van load of deliveries and driving. And uh, um, every day during my route, I hear on the radio, they'd say, day 152 of the Iran hostage crisis, day 183. Day 210. And, uh, you know, I mean, I was a regular guy. Austin, Austin, I was just like you. Not as good looking, probably not as talented, <laughs> but um, just like you. Just having fun. Right. Finished college, you know, played a little semi pro football, uh, having a good time working, dating my lovely bride. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, I just, I don't know. But, um, I guess I've always liked the military. I always liked uh, the, the idea of what I thought the military was about. You know, working out, kind of tough kind of life. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know a lot about it, but I, I sure in heck didn't like what was going on. And my buddies didn't either. And really none of my buddies were military guys. Again, just regular folks. Mm -hmm. But uh, something along the way just triggered me. And I said, you know, that's enough. So I, I went down, talked to the recruiter, I joined on what's called the delayed entry program. And then I went to my lovely fiance and said, listen, dear, we're going to have a change in plans. And Fran, God bless her. She, um, she said, listen, you know, let's go for it. Let's do it. So uh, I guess it was May or so, May 2nd, we got married. May 12th, I was on a train to Fort McClellan, Alabama, to become a soldier and to become a military policeman. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, and that directly leads into my next question. How did you feel serving as a military MP soldier as your, your first job kind of in the armed forces? Well, when, I, when the recruiter actually, you know, backed up before, before 
or actually the recruiter said, what do you want to do in the army? I had no idea. You know, he said, well, you know, your GT scores, that's the test you have to take. The after two test said you scored pretty high and uh, you could pretty much do anything. Why don't you become an MP military police? I go, let's do it. So my first duty station was up at Seneca Army Depot in the Finger Lakes, New York State. Franny worked as a dietitian across, across the street from where we were renting was the Geneva Hospital. And it, I don't know if you've ever been up to the Finger Lakes, Austin, but it's a beautiful, beautiful area, beautiful part of the state, beautiful part of the country. And uh, I was one of the guys. I was not an, an officer. I wasn't a, one of the leaders. I was a private. Um, I did make rank quick because I had you know, a, a good amount of college credits without a degree. Um, and I guess the first thing that happened was when I was in processing, gentleman said, hey, you got a lot of credits. You want to knock out a degree while you're here. Right. And I really didn't think of it when I left William Patterson. And who knows why I even left without the degree. I, I wasn't serious about school at the time. Not as serious as people like my son and daughter who are also grads of Monmouth U. Right. Or as people like you or your great professor, Professor Ziabro, <laughs> um, I learned it down the road. It was an acquired taste and skill for me. But I did get my degree from an external degree program that New York University offered at the time. And uh, I got to tell you, I loved, I loved it. I loved the mission. I loved my, the team, my teammates. Um, I made rank pretty quick. I was a specialist before you know it. And... Uh, uh, it just felt right for me. Right. I like the I like the running in the morning. I like the physical part. Mm -hmm. Unlike most of the other guys, you know, after work they would go have some fun. I would go to the gym and pump some iron, and then go. I lived off base because I was married. Most of my buddies lived in the barracks, and uh, you know, I'd go home to my lovely bride, and it was a it was a very special time. Even as a regular soldier, the the group. We, we had a lot of respect for each other. You know, of course, the troops, and again, I was, I led the troops, which we'll get to in a few minutes, but I was one of the troops in the beginning. And it was a great time. And uh, I got to know what the troops, you know, what they're about. And they're just, they're just like we are. There's no difference. The only difference is, you know, the mission that they had and what they might have to do. Um, I played on the uh, flag football team, the softball team, whatever was going on, they, they put me up for it, and I had a lot of fun doing it. So it was a, it was a special time, and I, I really loved those guys back then, guys and gals that I served with. I didn't hear you. That volume went away. Yeah, we may want to call a timeout. Can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Oh, you hear me now? Oh, we're good now. Yeah, you nope. may want to go and edit that later, but yeah. yes, we're, listen, it's such is life, the reality of life. Yeah. yeah, my headphone jacket popped out. I didn't realize. So Blame it on me. Yeah. Don't take it. Don't say I did something. <laughs> well, what I was going to say was I, I always thought that the military police was a really interesting profession because I, I really like looking into like military history stuff. It just seems like a really cool job to me. Well, Military police, my first job as an enlisted guy, my first duty station, we were physical security guards. The site up in New York State um, was a site that housed munitions. Some of the things were nukes. Interesting stuff. <laughs> and we didn't have a police mission, and we didn't even have a tactical mission, which most of my career was more of a tactical military police, supporting the maneuver elements, the infantry and the other guys. Um, but this was guarding and, and patrolling a nuclear site. And I saw your eyebrows go up. You're right. A lot of people had a hard time with that. Maybe I just wasn't as aware as other people. <laughs> I don't know, but it, did, it just didn't bother me. Um, you know, to me, it just was, I figured the people that were working the munitions knew what they were doing. And my teammates and I knew how to protect them. Everything just kind of worked out. Right. Okay. Um, for our next question, uh, could you just briefly tell me like one of your favorite memories from 
your years of active duty from 1981 to 2003? Yeah. Now, um, I'm going to say something. I hope we have a little fun with this, too. Um, you said briefly, you're smart to say that. Because when you get a, a retired soldier, <laughs> lieutenant colonel, sergeant major, so first sergeant, you, you got to hit the button because we could, when we're with good people like you, we could go for hours. <laughs> you also look at the size of the glass the person has. See how big that glass is? Yeah. So we could be here for months. Um, <laughs> Follow me. I was fortunate after my time up in Seneca, I went to the Army's Officers Candidate School. If you've ever seen the movie An Officer and a Gentleman, it's something like that. That was naval. And I guess the difference is those guys in that movie always seem to have a weekend pass. We up, we down at Fort Banning, Georgia, in the Army's OCS, we never got those weekend passes. I think I had a few hours off somewhere. In the, I don't remember. Right. <laughs> um, I was fortunate to go after OCS and commissioned as an Army Second Lieutenant. I did go to the Army's Paratrooper School, Airborne School down at Fort Benning, Georgia, three weeks training. I'm a graduate of the Army Air Assault School, which is repelling out of helicopters. And of course, all the Army Military Police Schools, which there's a few. Um, Austin, I was fortunate to have some great positions and, and assignments and adventures. But the real thing was I really served with some great people. And I had, was able to have my son, Ed, and daughter, Lily, my great wife, Fran, and Eddie was born in 83, Lily in 87. And uh, they, it was just a wonderful experience for all of us. I, uh, I would say, although company commander is what most people will say is the greatest time. I commanded in Korea uh, during desert storm and during heightened tensions. But my real, I would say the most enjoyable jobs I had was my first job as an officer, which was a platoon leader which is where me and the platoon sergeant are in charge of 40 or so other people. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. The platoon, it wasn't great when I got there. They were great individually, collectively not so good. And I guess my experience as an enlisted guy and just a lot of things came together and it worked out. My sergeants and I got along really well and we turned the platoon that wasn't too good into the platoon that was the best in the battalion. And the bigger thing was um, the camaraderie with the people. Now, military police have women. So I've served with women and, you know, throughout my career. I would say that the success my platoon had and that we had throughout my career was we had men and women of all races, colors, and creeds that came together as one. E pluribus unum, one. Out of many, one. We were not uh, interested in uh, hurtful, harmful. We worked hard. We played even harder. We were serious about the mission. We were serious about our families. We were serious about having fun, but always under the idea that we got a job to do. It's up to us to keep the place safe. So part of our job was to patrol Fort Dix, New Jersey. It's part of the 511th Military Police Company. And the other part was to be tactical soldiers for when we got called to go somewhere. And my guys and gals, you know, on occasion I hear from one or two, and, and it, I am always elated because I love them. The other good job I had, Austin, when I was a captain a few years later, I was a instructor at the military police school uh, for Army, the military police second lieutenants. And they're folks your age. They were anywhere between 21 and 28, 30 years old, give or take, uh, as, as I was a captain. And there were four captains per group. Each captain had like 12 to 15, you know, for the, that we were individually responsible for. We were like drill sergeants for the lieutenants. And they were some of the finest folks. And again, uh, worked hard, played hard. 
the I guess I guess I don't know, but what I used to hear the feedback was the reputation I had was that I was hard but fair, and this is what kind of followed me throughout my career. It always seemed Austin that in the beginning, in the beginning, for the most part, some folks some folks uh, were a little afraid, and I don't know why, but whatever. And then the fear kind of went to hatred where they like didn't like me, which really didn't bother me because I'm not there to be liked. We're there for a job. But right. somewhere along the way, Austin, the fear, which turned to hatred, became, I get it. I get why he's doing that. I understand now. And then the, the got it turned to respect and the respect turned to love. And I can say that for the overwhelmingly high majority of the folks I served with, we had that for each other. We all had a respect from day one, but it became something more as we served together. And I, I can't say all, because I'd be lying, nothing's absolute, nothing's perfect. Mm -hmm. But the overwhelmingly high majority, that's what we had. And that's why both my wife and I, Eddie and my, my daughter Lil, my son Eddie, we always like running into the old folks or hearing from them or getting together. Cause I guess it was some, we had something that was special, kind of like you have when you're on a, on a sports team or an activities team with a group of people where you work a mission together or employees or classmates that like to hang out and you get developed like a bond. You don't even see it coming. It just kind of happens. Well, I guess part of what I used to do, I would make it. In other words, I would make that part of what we're going to do we're going to get along and we're going to work hard. Right. So it was being a platoon leader and it was being a small group leader instructor that there were my two favorite jobs, but really I enjoyed them all. Yeah. From 81 to 2003, I was fortunate um, to be just around a lot of really good folks that were serious about their job, but pretty light about life and tried to enjoy as much of it as we could along the way. Yeah. That's really nice. It's cool to hear about. And um, I get, yeah, shifting the, the discussion, uh, what was your awareness of terrorism before 9-11? Was it something you ever thought about before that day? Actually, yes, because as a military policeman, we had formal training on terrorism from back when I was in advanced individual training right after basic training my officer basic course as a cycle lieutenant, my advanced course. Um, and of course, just being an MP. Uh, I will say this, I won't, I won't make things grand, more grandiose than they are. I was, my troops and I were in harm's way periodically through the years, but I served during a mainly peaceful time. It, we were involved in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. As a history, I know you know what the Cold War was. Yes. We won the Cold War, by our presence and the things we did with supposedly not a shot being fired in anger. It's not completely true. <laughs> I was in Honduras in the mid eighties yeah, and it was that. supposed to be, you know about Honduras. Mm -hmm. Well, we, um, we did have a few incidents down there that were probably not directed at us. We were there in side, which were the Contras and the Sandinistas were supported by the Nicaraguans. So we kind of, just because we were there helping them, we were, we, we were involved in supporting or defending some harm's way type situations. Um, but, I, but I've had training and I've had experiences with de dealing with terrorists and terrorism, but not too much. Mm -hmm. um, because again, from the time frame I served was, most of it was peace. We had some harm's way, but we were fortunate with the time we served. Yeah, I, I asked that question because I just I'm always interested in like the discussion of terrorism before 9-11, because I think about, I guess, like the Oklahoma City bombing and things like that. That was in the American psyche, but not really what we think of it today. So I just think it's really interesting to get that view, yeah. especially because I wasn't alive in that time frame. So I was born in 99. So. And, and, and most of my experience was before you were born. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the uh, formal training with terrorism, 
a lot, a lot of it hands on, a little bit, a little bit here and there. Okay. And pushing forward, I'm asking you, oh, where, so where and when did you hear about the events that were unraveling on the morning of September 11th, 2001? Very, very interesting. So I was the deputy commandant at that time of West Point Prep School when it was on Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, which was my last tour. I got there in 99, retired in 03. Austin, like many folks, I'm sure your folks, same thing. A lot of us remember where we were, just like when Kennedy was assassinated. As a kid, I remember where I was. As a kid, little kid. 9-11 is vivid. So I'm going to take you through the day if we have a few moments. I was a lieutenant colonel at the time and I was walking into the prep school. I used to enter through the back door, which was right in front of the human resource department. I was met at the door by specialist Robin Brunicardi. She was a fun troop. She was in the personnel. And uh, we actually, on occasion, we stay in touch. She lives not too far from here. Oh, cool. Um, she meets me at the door and she says, hey, Colonel, listen to this. Some guy flew his plane into, you know, one of the towns. I think nothing of it. I go, hey, listen, you know, it's probably some guy that had too much to drink. He was a little <laughs> off his barometer. You know, just kind of, we, we, again, military have a fun kind of different sense of humor. Yeah. Not harmful. <laughs> not, not, not the folks I trained with anyway. But we kind of didn't think anything of it. Austin. The last thing, the, I, the thought didn't even enter my mind. And I'm a military policeman. These right. thoughts always go through my mind. My buddies, my family will tell you that. And it's not paranoia. It's background. It's experience and it's training. I didn't even think about it. Wow. A few minutes later, I'm sitting in my office now. I'm, and a few minutes later, the same specialist, Robert Brudicardi, came in in tears. She was crying. I never saw this young person cry. She was lighthearted and fun. And I thought the world of her, still, I think the world of her. She came in in tears. She goes, sir, you need to come to the mess hall. We used to have the, the uh, staff had a TV, little area on the side of the mess hall where the staff with the sergeants and the officers would hang out. Here's a TV. She goes, you need to, we need you in there. So I went in there. And the sergeants are, and the officers, my, my boss, the commandant, the full colonel, I'm a lieutenant colonel, although we're both called colonel. And we're sitting there, everyone's serious. They, everyone had a more serious look than I've seen in, in their eyes in the time I knew them. And it's unfolding. And you see the smoke coming out of the one building. And then they show replay of the plane going into the second one. And the, all the sergeants, we all now, all us military guys realize what's going on. This is planned. This is, in fact, one of my sergeants said, the country now needs to be thinking of the West Coast. And the country needs to be thinking of Me what could be coming in from the South or somewhere else. Because this could be a diversion. That's how military people think. Wow. So now, Austin, we start unpeeling, unpeeling the onion. We start feeling out what do we have. So we bring all the students out to the formation area. It's where they stand for accountability. And we tell them what's happening. And of course, panic, fear, which, now let me also cut in here. You do know the soldiers I've served with, me, me top, top of the line, none of us were fearless. You follow what I just said? Yeah. We're, we're not fearless. My people are anyway. I tell you, I'm, I'm not. We just put fear aside. We don't think about it. We rely on our training. And we just do what has to be done. Yeah. But there's still that little bug going up your back. And there's still yeah. that. The fear's always the there. It's, it's there. You're right. You just put it aside. So we all put it. So we just came out. We told the troops. Now what each of the platoons, because prep school is broken down into platoons, 240 or so kids start the school. I call them kids. Now we have to start getting, you know, now the sergeants take over and the, and the captains. And we have to find out 
where people are, whose parents are in, could possibly be in the Pentagon, whose parents could possibly be in, um, in the um, New York City at the time. Towers, yeah. Every, who can be where? And we start unpeeling that. Now, while they're doing that, I'm trying to contact my family because I'm human too. My son was a senior at Monmouth Regional. My daughter was a freshman at Monmouth Regional. And if you, you, you might not know this, but that day, Austin, when that happened, it was very hard to communicate. I don't know if it was the overload of people trying to get on phones, whatever it was, it was very tough to communicate. Finally, I got through to my wife and we found out that the principal at the high school took over and my son and his buddies, you know, instead of being afraid, they're going, we're going to war. Let's go get these guys, which was great. And my daughter, who's a freshman, she's like, got back to me, you know, she's, she's afraid. But the principal at the time, Dr. George, did a fantastic job at bringing everyone and informing them and calming them down. Same thing we do with the prep school. Wow. <clears throat> the day now is unfolding. It's later in the day, and I was as the I was as a deputy commandant. You got three hats. You're the assistant commandant. You're the commanding officer of the military staff, and you're the liaison to the Fort Monmouth community. So they had told us there was going to be a meeting at like six o'clock at the garrison headquarters on Fort Monmouth to sort out this this thing we're dealing with. And of course, through the day, Austin, the sergeants are talking to these kids. Everyone's trying to find out what the heck is going on. That evening at six o'clock, I met who would become a close friend of mine, a gentleman named Colonel Retired Mike Ruane. This one's what I'm gonna tell you now is one for the books. That morning, on Fort Monmouth, Mike Ruane and the people from the fort we're doing a training exercise that was the exact same thing that happened that morning. You follow what I just said? They were doing a training exercise. I think I've heard of that trained. before. Yeah, that, that was yeah. on Fort Monmouth. Okay. Mike Ruane, my buddy, who I'm friends with now and who I worked with as a civilian, was the guy that put that exercise on. We found out that evening that Mike had to come into the theater at Fort Monmouth which by the way, Bruce Springsteen has played and John Bon Jovi. That's another, that's another uh, interview. <laughs> he had to get in front right. of the people for the exercise. He had to put a halt to the exercise and say what we were just training on is actually happening. Everybody has to go back now to, the, to your, your agency on Fort Monmouth for further instruction. So that evening, we all came in to a room and find out what we were going to do to close Fort Monmouth. I don't know if you've ever driven on Fort Monmouth, Austin, but it used to be an open base. You could drive through it anytime you want. Oh, really? I've just after seen the outside. Yeah. Right. After 9-11, we closed it off. And oh. we, regular folks, before they could get a, a, a force, we were all taking turns standing the gate. Like it could have been a civilian with a Department of Defense police officer. It could have been a prep school sergeant, you know, with someone else. And, and we, all, we all came together to do that. There's still more to the story. Now I go back to prep school. I check on my family. I can take a deep breath because they're okay. During the day, if you recall, do you remember Flight 93? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good man. Good man. You pay attention to your history. I get, I'm not going to get emotional now because I've hit my button here. You hit this button, it makes the emotion hold off. Yeah. But when I think of those folks saying, let's roll, when they knew they were going to die, that is, there's an old expression that a coward dies a thousand deaths, but a hero dies just once. Those people, they only died once. They, it, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing they did. Yeah. Um, that's all in the same day now, Austin. All in the same day. As you recall, a couple of the planes hit New York City. One of the planes went to the Pentagon. Okay. I find, I remember one of my friends at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Grunewald, who's a buddy of mine, 
He was in the Pentagon. He was there where the plane came to him. We thought we lost Bob. So all this is playing on my mind. I go back to check on the prep school kids and now I could take a deep breath. Everyone's accounted for. One of my sergeants comes in, he goes, hey, sir, we got one more. And he brings in can't, could, prep school cadet candidate, Haley Mercer. Have you ever heard of Heather Mercer? No. Okay. You, you might want to Google this. I'm going to just give you the shortened version. You could Google Heather Mercer, aid worker, U.S. Christian aid workers. She was in, I believe, Afghanistan. Her and the people she was with were arrested because supposedly they went into some house to give aid. But the, the Taliban thought they were preaching Christianity, which they were. So they were arrested. Mm -hmm. On 9-11, they became, I guess, the equivalent of a prisoner of war. Oh, wow. And they were possibly going to be uh, sentenced to death for spreading Christianity. Heather Mercer was the sister of Haley Mercer, one of my students. So now we're going, oh boy, this one just, the ante just got raised. So we made contact with the family. Of course, they couldn't make contact with the sister. She's now in a prison in, in if I remember right, I want to say Kabul, Kabul, if I'm saying it right. So then they get home that night. Everything's kind of in place. And my wife and I are going, I wonder how Bobby G is doing, Bobby Grunewald. So I called Nancy Grunewald, who I haven't talked to in a bunch of years. Luckily, I still had Rob's number. His wife answers the phone, Austin, and she's crying. And I go, uh, no. So I go, Nancy, talk to me. And she got through the tears. She goes, Bob was wounded. Bob's injured. He's in a hospital. We don't know if he's going to make it. Bob was an instructor. I mentioned the MP schoolhouse. When I, Bob was a fellow instructor. And that's how we became buddies. Yeah. You, get, you gain a bond when you go through things like that. So now we got a lot of prayers for that evening. For the folks in New York, the folks in the Pentagon, the troops, people in Afghanistan, Heather Mercer, Haley Mercer, my student, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Grunewald and a host of others. And I'm sure if, if you ever talk to your folks, your cousins, your aunts and uncles, everyone's got some type of story, yeah. whether it's a short one or a longer one like mine. Um, that's my story for the day. That was just one right. day in 9-11. There's a little more to it but I'm going to hold off on it to see what other questions yeah. you might have along the same line. Yeah. So I guess this goes into, uh, I'm going to skip one question ahead. Uh, I'm asking what changes did you notice in your community, like local and broadly the whole country, like immediately after, like just the atmosphere, what it was like? Boy, that's a, that's a, that's a home run question. Thank you. Joe Laporta. Joe Laporta is a close friend of mine. We became buddies with William Patterson playing football. We remained friends. Again, he's a regular guy. I mean, he's more, I'm the calm one of the group. Joe's a maniac. Joe is the good looking guy. Joe always, you know, had folks around him. I'm kind of more just, I'm John. I'm, you know, I'm at the gym, whatever. Anyway, so I talked to Joe, the regular guy, the hell rate, you know, a lot of fun. A couple of days later, you start checking on each other. And Joel told me something profound. He said, John, the wildest thing happened. He said, I went outside in Bergenfield, New Jersey, my block in Bergenfield. He said there were houses all lined up with American flags. He wow. said, I never saw that, never saw that before. He said, people in the neighborhood were coming out to talk to each other. People bonded. And I don't want to. I don't want to get too fired up. <laughs> I've been told I can get fired up. But with our Americans and our allies, 
one thing I've seen, and I guess I, you know, I went from being that regular guy from Patterson to being that old soldier somewhere along the line. But I, I saw what I'd been seeing through the years with my troops. Well, we had this. We were if you if you I don't advocate fighting, okay? But if you fought one of my MPs, you fought the whole darn platoon, forty of us. <laughs> If you fought one person in my company, you fought all 300 and some with all civilians and everything. Anyway, the neighborhoods became like that. People got closer. People got warmer. It, it, you don't want something like that to happen, but it was that significant emotional event that brought people together. And, and what I was saying about Americans and our allies, we, real, real Americans, real people that, all, all of us, we're all real Americans with all personalities, all different likes and dislikes. It's all good. I don't care if Democrat, Republican, it means nothing to me. Americans, we, you can't, don't push us around. Don't push us around. Don't, don't fight my platoon. If you try to fight someone in my platoon, you're going to get about eight women, 32 guys, and a crazy lieutenant from Patterson, and we're going to be leading the charge. And that's what, what happened, like, you know, across the country. Ball games, people that hated President Bush were rooting for him, and people that didn't like that politician or that team. We all hate the Red Sox because I'm a Yankee fan. You know, we all hate the Cowboys because I'm a Giants fan. But by God, <laughs> they hugged before the game. They hugged after the game. Yeah, it was it was it was. Uh, you know, you hate to go through something that got us there, but it it actually brought the country together. For the over again, nothing's absolute. Not everybody. You know, some of my buddies that are you know we used to call back in the day that we'd call them hippies. You know, got close to my close buddies. You know, and then there's the jocks and there's the, everybody came together. Everybody, everybody said, hey, I'm American. People had flags that I never would have thought would hold a flag. And it was, uh, so, you know, a lot of things like, the, 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 a lot of things like that actually happened. And, and we saw it in real time. We saw it in real time. Right. And another question. What was your reaction to the Bush administration launching military operations into Afghanistan that October 2001 and the aftermath okay. of that? Here's, I'm going to answer that this way. I'm going to throw in, if you don't mind, a little backtrack because there's more to the story that yeah. I started with the, with the uh, Heather Mercer. Mm -hmm. But at what, I was at prep school at the time. Um, I, I fall into the General George Patton philosophy. He had a philosophy, I don't agree with it, but I'm gonna tell you where this is going. He had a philosophy that he didn't think soldiers should even vote because we're supposed to be not a political party. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to take our instructions. We're supposed to trust our civilian leaders, our president, our secretary of defense and all that. And we're supposed to trust that all those people got things in the right direction. So of course, I, you know, I, I don't believe in that completely, but the philosophy I understand. So as a soldier, I will defer to give an opinion on that. What I will say, I think correct actions needed to be taken towards who they believed, who we believed did something like this to innocent American civilians. Um, and I guess history will write itself, will make the determination on what the intel they had at the time. Was that the right move? Was it done correctly? As I said, as a professional soldier, as a professional officer, um, I have been the guy, Austin, that would go behind closed doors and talk to a few of my bosses, but nobody ever knew about it. It was a uh, united front afterwards. I want to just say, I, I, I hope that what the actions that were taken 
with hopefully the intel that they had lent to the actions that were taken. Obviously, actions had to be taken. I look more, though, at the bravery of the military guys and gowns that when executed those missions, the kids that were in Fallujah, from your history, you know that that was one of the early yeah. hot spots. The two battles, um, yeah. It was, there was, you know, we had some, I mean, there was a professional football player, Pat, um, Pat Tillman. Pat Tillman, yeah, I've heard of him. Pat Tillman, who left them a lucrative, you know, multi, I guess, million dollar, whatever, mm -hmm. um, who en enlisted, went in, didn't even go in as an officer, went in as one of the troop, like I started my career, mm -hmm. and as you know, was killed there. Um, the fog of war actually was, he was, a, he was a, I guess, a victim of the fog of war, which is a real thing. But mm -hmm. it was that kind of bravery, dedication. Um, that's what I kind of, that's what I look at more. But I also want to touch on this, Austin, because there's a very, a very happy ending to the Mercer story I was telling you about. And again, you could, you could Google it. it there's more in depth. Heather. Mercer, Dana, somebody, her friend, and a few of the other aid workers were in prison. They thought they might, they might die. Somewhere along the line, they were freed by anti-Taliban folks from the prison. Right. And they were captured, they were rescued by United States Army Special Forces folks in a helicopter, couple helicopters that swooped in and took them to safety. Wow. It was, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you pick up, you hear this a lot. You get a pen in the paper and you want to make a, a, an award-winning movie that'll make us millions of dollars. And someone will look at that and say, yeah, a little too far-fetched. This is real. This is why, besides me personally, besides my, my Lord and my family, in that order, for any other and Lily, my heroes are my close friends and my troops. Your professor is one of my heroes, Professor <laughs> Ziabro. Um, those troops, knowing full well what could happen, they went towards the sound and sights of danger. Regardless, my troops and I have been in situations like that here and there throughout the years. We all, get, we all get our chance in the, in the barrel. And it was such a profound thing that good, you know the, you know the show Good Morning America? Mm -hmm. You're yeah. good, you've heard of it. I've heard of it. During the school year, Good Morning America had contacted through the parents, us, a prep school, to have the sister Haley Mercer go on TV with the parents to oh, talk really? about. Yeah, this, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so at graduation that year, the graduation was whatever it was, May or so, 2002. One of the people at graduation is Heather Mercer, the sister that was arrested. And she, and she, because, um, you know, we would check on Haley, the student, throughout the year. Well, Heather comes over. I had no idea she was going to be there. I just didn't know. And she comes over and she says, hello, Colonel. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Heather Mercer. I took a step back. Now, I don't get, listen, I'll be honest with you. I really, I'm not starstruck. I really don't get too excited meeting a professional athlete, a so-called entertainer or a politician. Everyone to me is kind of special in their own way. But I did enjoy meeting Heather. And she took me to the side. I, I might get emotional. She took me to the side and she said, I got to tell you, Colonel, I heard about what you all did for my sister. And that meant a lot. That was a great thing. And the truth is, I saw a Lewis her sergeants, but thank you. And, you know, it was a team effort. But I said, and she goes, I got to tell you, you're like one of my heroes. I said, well, let me tell you something, Heather. <laughs> I said, it's really funny you say that because I'm not but you're one of mine. What you and those people, you, what you guys went through. And, and she goes, well, it was the special forces guys. They're great and this and that. And I said to her, but you got a lot of courage. Yeah. 
And she whispered to me, she goes, you know what? Someday I might go back and do it again. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> where do you get that kind of courage? Yeah. So that was a really special moment for me um, that it was one of those, and it doesn't always work out that way, but it was one of those where it had like a happy ending. Yeah. You know, those like fairy tale endings, they do happen once in a while, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was good that that was one of them. Mm -hmm. And another question I have, do you think that the U.S. and I guess the world are safer with heightened security reforms within military and law enforcement, like immediately after if the war on terror? Oh, boy. I do. I do, but whether it's terrorist type of bad guys or your basic criminal type of bad guys, you know, an MPs, you get to deal with both. The regular criminal, you know, robberies, other assorted things, which I don't want to mention, or terrorists, they, they have a lot of time on their hand because you see like your job is being a student. And after this, you're gonna go on to whatever your field is gonna be. And that's gonna be, gonna consume most of your time. Mine was soldier and then Department of the Army civilian. And between my family, my job, the beach, the weight room, pizza, the Marx Brothers, you know, those things consuming my time. I'm full, I got a full day. The bad guys don't. The terrorists have all day and all week and all month to be patient and to plan and to train. That the criminals in general, terrorists are another type of criminal. There are criminals in our country, and this is going to sound really wild. So if you want to erase this later, that's fine. Yes. Criminals, there's actually criminals that are like not anti-American. I know that sounds bizarre. <clears throat> Terrorists are anti-American, anti-freedom, anti-American ally, anti-things that we believe in. Some of the things we believe in that we even disagree with, that we disagree with amongst our own selves, they hate. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a it's a complicated world. Yeah. It's a complicated question. I do think I think we're safer, Austin, because uh, it's kind of like the vigilance. You must remain vigilant. I guess I kind of had that growing up, you know, on, in a, in a, the neighborhood. You get yeah. you're always vigilant. To a degree, not talking paranoia, just, just regular old being alert. And in the military, that's your job. We have to be alert so the rest of the country doesn't have to, so that the rest of the country can exercise freedom. We try to protect it. The country's got to exercise it. That's how it all works. Yeah. Uh, so I do, I do think we are. Now, could there be a discussion as to is there a level of overdone, underdone? Sure. Because it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect science. Um, and, and I can't say that, well, everything's going to be rosy because, again, that wouldn't be true. I can say things are better when we are heightened. Things are better when we're a higher level of awareness. Things are better when we're tighter as a country, when we're tighter as a community. Things are better when we can talk through our differences and kind of get to common ground. Right. And we'll be, that's how we're better. And you can look at every country. Because remember, we weren't alone in this. There were the, off the top of my head, I know the British, the Australians, the, you know, the, the, the Spanish, the French, yeah. all of them. Yeah. We were all, we were all rocking together because we all want the same thing. We just want freedom. We want to be able to live our lives the way we choose, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. Oh, actually going back on that, um, I just thought that was an interesting question because uh, like growing up, I mean, it's, I, wouldn't, I guess it's something I would notice, like I remember being like 
certain airports or train stations, I would see army soldiers in like New York City. And I know that's like a byproduct of, I feel like, of the heightened security. So it's just interesting, something I just grew up in my whole life, just seeing that more security, more like counter terror police on the street with bigger weapons and stuff. So, you know, and let me just t briefly touch on that. Um, that that's something in reverse. Like you're seeing things that, you know, we're both seeing things we didn't have at different times in our life. Growing up, we didn't, we didn't see that. You go to an airport, you, you could get there 15 minutes early. If you made it before the door closed, and I've been there a couple of times, as the doors close and I'm coming on the plane, you know, yeah. <laughs> now, you, what do you got? You got a plan for being there an hour early, like, I guess? It's like two hours, I feel like. Two hours early. You know, it's a full day yeah. <laughs> when you fly. I, I'd rather run there. <laughs> So, um, you know, that, that's, that's a byproduct of the experience. You, you kind of hope that the world can kind of evolve back to where it was. I don't know if it ever will. I don't know. None of us really do. But, um, yeah, you see, you grew up, which normal to you was abnormal to me in reverse. Wow. We, we didn't have that. You know, we didn't, we didn't, you didn't have that worry. Um, kind of have a couple more bigger questions. Uh, so with events like the recent pullout in Afghanistan and just a smaller American presence, like overall in the Middle East, do you think that we should be more focused or continue to focus on addressing terror groups or should we, should the U.S. shift their focus onto more like rogue countries like China and Russia and Iran, North Korea, something like that? with bigger issues like that? I know that's a big question, so. Yeah, and it is, and you you noticed the way I answered the previous, one of the previous mm -hmm. questions. I'm, by design, and this isn't just for the interview, by design, I I don't, I'll, I'll get as deep into a political type question as I feel I can bring value, because as I said, as a professional soldier, um, our job isn't to give that, it's to, take the mission and execute to the best of our ability, but I'm an American too. And I'm a relatively smart guy and I can kind of figure things out. And um, I would say it's probably a combination. I think that, and you know, here's the funny thing. You mentioned a few Russia, China, you know, no surprise. The people of those countries, because I've got buddies, ladies and gentlemen, the Russian, China, all the country, the people are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. People are yeah. wonderful. I would assume. Hundred <laughs> percent. It's when you get into the geopolitical, military, comma comma whatever. Yeah. You know when it gets complicated. I would say kind of yes to everything you said. I would say yes. We, I feel, we have to keep a presence against terrorism because. That's just the, the threat that the world has experienced. All of us. Yeah. We do have to keep a level. Now, how much, how much resourcing, how much money, how much precious blood, how much human engineering we have to put in, that's where the, the uh, intel and the smart people, the leaders have to come together, not only within our country, within our allies, to kind of have a game plan. As far as against our adversaries, and again, you hope that the world starts maturing and adversary number minimizes mm -hmm. and the friend number grows, we have to continue to, like I, as I told you, I was during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. The main threat was Russia at the time. Of course, you know, the, the wall, when the wall came down, every, I was in Korea at the time, actually. It was a time oh. to party. It was a great, great time. Um, we owe, that's why you have to have a good military. And, and I like to see that, the, I, I'm going to put a little plug in for the whole darn country. When I went in, it was on the heels of Vietnam. We won't get into Vietnam because there's discussion all Separate. different ways. Yeah. <laughs> My look is always towards the soldiers. And back then, a lot of the soldiers weren't treated the way they are now. The military is treated, I, I got to tell you, from 81 to 2003, I was never disrespected. Now, I don't know if people just thought I was nuts. 
I don't like to think that was the case. I think it was the people realized the troops are here to help. Yeah. They're not all perfect, but we police our own. There's a device called court martial, Article 15, call it what you want. Yeah. We and we trained Austin. And by training, we kept the the deterrent high. And when the deterrent is high, and when you do those type things, when you train for a possible threat, you more than likely hopefully don't have to fight the threat. Yeah. And that's what we want. We want a strong military, but not an overwhelming military. Just enough so that the rest of the country can exercise the freedom. Yeah. That's what we want. So I think we have to be vigilant towards okay. both. Yeah. That was a long answer to a <laughs> relatively easy question. <laughs> and these are my closeout questions. I guess this is a two-part for my last question. So the first part is, uh, why do you think that the tragic events of September 11th should not be forgotten? Um, well, first of all, yes, I do deeply. I think that Pete, anyone that says, well, it didn't happen that way, they didn't live through it. I think people that say, well, it's time to get over it. I said, that's wrong. I don't think it should be, again, something at the forefront. It's kind of like all the, the rights, all the wrongs that we've create, corrected in our country. And we've had wrong. Our country's not perfect. Yeah, yeah. It's great. It's the greatest country. Not perfect. We are really good, though, because we'll correct the wrongs. We do our best to correct wrongs, mm -hmm. whether we made the wrongs or whether other countries. The Holocaust can never happen again. We have to remember it. Slavery must never happen again to any peoples anywhere ever again. Mm -hmm. What happened in the 60s to many of my friends of different color can never happen again. Americans should be able to go into any bar they want, sit in any part of the bus they want, drink out of any water fountain they want. And those things, again, they, we, we're, we're all always getting better. We need to get better. And you need, you need to remember them so that they don't happen again. And we do have to remember 9-11. See, Pearl Harbor hit America, but it didn't hit the mainland. Mm -hmm. And that's where Pearl Harbor, the people that lived through that, was so incredibly bad because it's kind of like, think about where you are. You're, you're in, are you in your dorm? Is that your dorm room? Or your I'm, house? A, I'm off campus right by the school. Okay. Yeah. Don't even go any further. We don't <laughs> take away any of the, here's, here's the point I'm making. It would be like someone coming into your place uninvited. Right. I'm trying to hurt somebody. That's hitting the home. That's our country. When you hit Hawaii, when you hit New York City, when you hit the Pentagon, that's, oh, you're fighting us now. And America went on for my whole life. It was always, I've never been hit on the we, wars we fought, except for the Civil War. Our wars were fought on other, you know, fight them there so we don't have to, our civilians and our families don't have to be, you know, collateral damage. So, we have to always be vigilant. We have to always correct our wrongs. And we have to make sure people that wronged us never, ever wrong us again. Yeah, definitely. And then the last part of this is, do you think that uh, every American should actively serve their country? And what I mean by that is, should they, whether it's military or doing something like community service or even doing something like this interview, like just... Should everyone be involved with their community? I think all good Americans are. I think every, I think every, when I say good, I'm, I am in by design eliminating the bad guys. Because <laughs> there are some bad people. Mm -hmm. Some are unintentional. I don't mean them. I don't mean folks like us that might make mistakes, speed and I mean intentionally bad people. Take them off the, off, off the slate. Yeah. And I think every American does serve. Every American. You're serving right now. You're serving because you're doing this project. My daughter served because she would put on concerts for the troops. My son served because he worked on Fort Monmouth for a couple, when he was uh, in college. Um, 
And those were examples of kind of even military related. Every one of us that, every one of us that exercises, the, now this is going to sound like a pitch for the military. This isn't. I don't think everyone should serve in the military. I think that would be incorrect. I don't think we need a draft. Okay. I think the volunteer army has been an incredible and incredible success. I will tell you this, the folks I served with from 81 to 2003 and the folks I served with as a civilian, and this is just my experience. We were the Marines, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, Army, me, of course, MP. We were trained like we were Rangers. I would train my soldiers like they were special forces so we could be there with them when they needed us. Yeah. We were so good that we were on par, maybe one notch above the Spartans of old Greece. <laughs> the old 300. Yeah, if you've ever 300. done any, I know you've, your history. They were raised to protect the country. They were raised to be military. They were amazing. Our guys and gals are right there with them, maybe a little stride ahead of them. And that's a compliment to both. That's a compliment to both. But we need the, all of the country to not serve in the military. You, can, you don't ever want an over-encompassing. Community, community service, yes. Good citizenship, absolutely. Patriotic, if you're patriotic, if you're just, and I don't mean you have to have a flag and you got to have a headband right. that says U.S. I don't mean that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you know, you, you talk to your crazy Uncle Vinny or, you know, Aunt Jess that served right. and you just say, thanks, thanks. That's it. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. a patriot. Yeah. If, you, if you work at your job as best you can, you're exercising freedom. That's patriotic. Mm -hmm. Everyone serves. It's, it's not just the military that keeps freedom. It's everybody. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, that's real, true patriotism. And then when the people that aren't in the military respect those that did serve, that makes you patriot. And when the people that did serve in the military just love the people that are, are appreciative of them, that's everyone exercising their freedoms. So I do... I don't think everyone should serve in the military. I'm, I am 100% uh, against that. I am 100% though for anyone that wants to serve. Yeah. I am 100% in for the volunteer military. I am 100% into drill sergeants being as tough as nails. <laughs> I'm 100% into the soldiers being tough as nails. I'm 100% to be training being as hard as possible. I would make training as hard as I could but never dog people. I never dog. If I did, I was wrong. I never intended to. I never dog. I pushed the limits because I never, I always wanted my soldiers to come back with their shield and not on it. You know what that means? Uh, I wanted them to come back walking, uh, yeah. not another way. Mm -hmm. So I think we, Every part of America that exercises the freedoms that we're fortunate enough to keep, we're patriots. And when we're patriotic, we're heroes. And we don't got to be corny about it. I'm not. I, I'm a regular old guy. Just, you know, just that I do. I do. I have lived in other places. I've seen that other places might not do things the way we do. We have freedoms that people can't even understand. They, they don't even understand until like they watched the Olympics this past year and that kid from Belarus had to come out. You Yeah, again, yeah. people just look at real, real facts, real mm -hmm. things. We have a great, we have a great thing in our country. We can actually yeah. openly disagree. Yeah, like that Belarus thing, just looking at that country, because I know that was in the news with the, something about, it was like a migrant thing. They were basically like manufacturing something like a whole scandal like because it's like it's i know it's a dictatorship and it's like russian supported it's just, just whatever it is just looking at like what those people can't do and just compare it to the american experience is pretty it's, uh stark the difference i feel like you know the only time i see us boo boo is when we 
don't respect each other. And I mean, you could take that even to people's property or store owners. When, like when people don't respect their business and they try to steal from them, or when we try to hurt each other, when we respect each other, we can have all the differences in the world. Mm-hmm. As long as we respect each other, yeah. we allow everyone to have theirs. But yeah, what you heard about that, listen, the, you know, the, the, um, the uh, what do you call them? The, the drivers, the, uh, not the cab drivers. What are they called now? The um, Uber drivers? Yeah, you go, Uber drivers. Okay. One of my, one of the guys who I've informally become buddies with was a Russian soldier. Oh, wow. And he knows I'm a retired U.S. soldier. <laughs> and he's picked us up, my family up a couple times. And uh, we, it's a respect for each other because we weren't the politicians. We were no. the soldiers. No. We loved the same things. Mm-hmm. In fact, here, I'll leave you with a question. I wonder why he's here. Yeah. Why do people want to come to America? Yeah. Yeah. And to close, before we close out the whole interview, is there anything else you want to add or anything left? Just last comment. You know, I I think, I think I, I think I pretty much said it all. I do want to say a few things. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to give you big kudos for taking on this project. Thank you. I hope I didn't keep you too long. No, not at all. Um, because, like I said, you know, remember, size yeah. of the glass. <laughs> um, I think you should be proud of what you're doing. And um, I think you should be proud of history. As I said a couple of times, you got a really outstanding professor. Um, I, I, I just ask that everyone just take a moment to appreciate each other, appreciate the country. Oh, oh, Veterans are not supposed to be out there all the time. They're not supposed to be what they're not supposed to be celebrities. They're not supposed to make uh, get rich off of being military. Right. Um, you know, we're supposed to do our job and uh, just keep the country safe. It's great when people like you and other people, so many that I know, uh, just too many, I can't count, um, that do respect the military. And I'll give you just one quick and then we'll. <laughs> so when I was a SEG lieutenant, you remember Grenada? You know yeah, about Grenada? I've heard of that, yeah. We were on, I've been on the runway. I, I was on the runway twice, but didn't, we were told to stand down. And once I did deploy. But this, we were on alert for Grenada. Now Grenada, the first wave went in as a, like a training exercise that they put them on the planes and they went. And that's, they ended up in Grenada. We were on alert for that. We were stood, stood down for the war part because it ended in two weeks. But they didn't know, you know, there was the police action for a while. So one morning, and my bride remembers, my son won't because he was this big. There you go. But my bride remembers because we were in a unit that had to be prepared to go within 72 hours. So your stuff had to always be packed. This was when I was a platoon leader. I told you that was my favorite job. Mm-hmm. So we get the call one morning, three in the morning, you know, so now in two hours, we're heading down from Fort Dix to um, Lakehurst, maybe a 25 minute drive or so, I don't remember, from Fort Dix, and it's dark, and we look, we get there, we look, they tell us where to load, get, get ready to go. My vehicle was supposed to be the last one off for the entire company, because I was going to be the first vehicle out whatever we were driving into, I was going to be the one leading the pack, my platoon, me up front. So we got all ready. And then someone comes out and says, okay, stand down. This was a training exercise. So everyone takes the deep breath. Everyone gets, you know, okay, mentally ready. Now let's on the, we were driving back Austin in the outside of a town in little Fort Dix, New Jersey. I don't remember if it was Pemberton. Are you from New Jersey? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this I'm side of town. Uh, I'm I'm from Hunterdon County, like Northwest Jersey. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know it well. So we're driving back to Fort Dix, and the wildest thing happened. It's kind of like shrubbery trees and all. Yeah. You know, you're going along, and then you start getting close to the town. You start driving into the town, if you will. 
And now it must be eight o'clock in the morning. It's like 8.30. And people now, it was quiet, quiet area. People were starting to come out of stores. And my, my whatever, 50 vehicles, whatever we, no, 50, vehicles, 50 troops, whatever many vehicles, you know, 12 vehicles or whatever it was, were humming down the road. And people stopped when they saw our vehicles. So this is 1983. So, you know, it's years after the Vietnam stuff and everyone started loving each other again. People started clapping as we drove by. And they were waving their hands and, and people came, they heard the noise, people coming out of buildings. People were coming out of stores and houses and they're all waving at us like, like, you know, in a World War II movie that you see yeah. where they're driving through, the, in Italy, they're driving through and everyone comes out and throws things at them. Yeah. And my troops, my driver looked at me, he goes, LT is short for lieutenant. Mm -hmm. He goes, LT, this is like we're in a World War II movie. This is amazing. Yeah. Wow. And I mentioned that because that's that love and respect. Mm -hmm. We didn't ask for it. We didn't look for it. We had no idea it was even going to happen. Mm -hmm. It was just the coolest thing. And what that did, what regular people did was they fired up our troops. Yeah. So now my troops want to work harder for the people that were thanking them. Wow, I really and like that. Yeah. Together. That's why I say for real, we're, we all, in a way, we serve. We all, we're all serving, all patriots, all good people. We serve. We are e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service. This was really fun to do this. I was nervous before and kind of stressed, but it really worked out. So. Well, I got to tell you, I think you did a really good job. I Thank know you. you're a history major. Yeah, I'm a history major. Yeah. Well, if you went to comms, you would be you'd do really good at that too. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you you ask just right. You have good active listening skills. You did a you did really well. Oh, did you, did you make communications comm? Is that what you meant? Yeah, comm. Oh, comm. Okay. Oh wow. Thank you. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah.